Welcome to the Bible Questions podcast brought to you by BibleQuestions.org and the Holly Street Church of Christ. This podcast is dedicated to answering your Bible questions from the Bible. My name is Jeff, and along with Brian, we are the hosts of this program. Hello, and welcome to the Bible Questions podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We have Brian and Jeff along, and with us today is also Alan Hitchin, which for our regular listeners, he's going to be a familiar voice to you all. And so, guys, I guess today we want to talk about discouragement. And to me, this is one of those what I might call universal subjects where all of us as just human beings in general are discouraged from time to time. And so I appreciate, Alan, you putting together some thoughts around, you know, what does the Bible teach us about how we should deal with discouragement? Because certainly it can take us down this dark path where we start blaming God and blaming others. Or we can just become depressed, as we might say, and it, it might also lead to unrighteousness. But if we, as I'm sure you'll point out, Alan, uh, deal with this in the correct way, the Bible gives us some real tangible things that we can think about and practice as it relates to discouragement. So, Jeff, before we hand it to Alan, let me just turn it over to you, and, and maybe you uh, have some thoughts as well on discouragement and, and this subject in general. Well, the only thing I, I might add is, you know, you talked about it being universal. And, you know, certainly that's true. I mean, just, you know, living in the world, you know, things often don't turn out the way, you know, we want them to, would like them to. You know, in addition to that, there's things like, you know, challenges on the job or if, if you know, our listeners are in school or, you know, challenges with our neighbors or whatever the case may be. Uh, but over and above that, and in addition to that, in some ways, Christians uh, can face additional challenges, you know, of trying to live, you know, righteously in a somewhat wicked world and have, you know, temptations to sin or family problems because of their religious stance, uh, etc. Et so, as you said, a very uh, a universal and uh, timely topic for today. Absolutely is. So, Alan, when you put together this study, what was maybe you can just talk a little bit about why, why you feel like this is an important subject to talk about from time to time? Well, the reality is once we become a Christian, we become God's servant. And we just have to understand that some of the things God asks us to do are, are going to be very discouraging. Uh, if we look at God and ultimately what will happen, then Paul says in Romans chapter 8, that uh, we are more than conquerors. And so as we look to God and we look to the ultimate outcome of our lives, if we stay, if we stay faithful to the Lord, uh, we're going to be conquerors. We're going to feel victorious. We're going to feel that ultimately we will win the victory. But sadly, the work God asks us to do, working with sinners, often brings defeat. Uh, listen to what Stephen said in Acts chapter 7. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you have now become the betrayers and murderers. So think about it like this. Jesus came to this earth and he knew he was going to be victorious, but the victory required him to be persecuted and put to death. Now, if he focused on the results of his work, he would be very discouraged. But if he focuses on the fact that God is using him for a specific task, and as long as he can complete that task, the results are not the issue. And so that's really going to be our theme uh, of, the, of the lesson today, is going to be looking at God's servants and seeing how they ultimately became victorious, but also how they went through momentary lapses of discouragement. And I think really, before we get started, uh, Jeff, if you'd like to read, there's a passage in Luke chapter 6 where Jesus makes it very clear that the results of our work could lead to discouragement. Luke chapter 6, looks like roughly verse 22 for starting. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. And, you know, I think that that's a good passage because of the contrast. 
you know, when people don't like us, despise us, hate us, uh, call us names, uh, et cetera, you know, our natural reaction can go in a number of different directions, but one direction is like, you know, being, you know, discouraged or saddened, unhappy, uh, et cetera, downcast, depressed, whatever. And, and yet in this passage, you know, we're blessed. You know, we are to rejoice, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. A very, very distinctive contrast. Yeah. And that's, that's why I wanted to start with this, because we're going to be seeing this contrast with Elijah, with Moses, with Jeremiah, with Ezekiel, with Baruch. As Jesus says at the very end here, in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. And I think it's very instructive for us to go back and look at the circumstances that these people were laboring under and realize what Jesus is saying here. Each one of them was given a task, a task that they would be able to do. Like God told Jeremiah, they will not be able to prevail against you because I am with you. And yet, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because the job or responsibility that God gave Jeremiah to do was to be the last preacher before the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of God's people, and they were at their low as far as the wickedness that was going on there. And as we look out at the world today, it's it's a little bit discouraging, but it's a still God has a job, a work for us to do, and that is to continue preaching. And he's already told us, if you'll look to me and you'll do what I'm asking you to do, you will ultimately be victorious, but men are going to hate you. They're going to exclude you, they're going to revile you, and they're going to cast out your name as evil. Now, if we focus on what men are doing to us, clearly we're going to get discouraged. But if we focus on what God is asking us to do, and the victory that we're going to gain simply because we're doing what God asked us to do, and that's Jesus' point in verse 23, Rejoice and leap for joy, for your reward is great in heaven. And then he says, Just remember those Old Testament prophets, because they are going to give you, remember in James, he says that, look to the prophets and the outcome of the Lord, they were ultimately victorious. So we're, we're going to start this, this uh, podcast with Elijah, because Elijah is a classic example of what we're dealing with here. And the job that he gave him to do was a really difficult job. It was, you know, like like when you think of Noah. Was Noah's working on the ark and being a preacher of righteousness, was it successful? Well, of course it was successful. And God has put him in Hebrews 11 because he did what he was asked to do. But if he looked at the results, here we are, we're all in the ark. God closes the door, and the only people in the ark are his family. Everyone else is outside. That's got to be discouraging. And yet, he was victorious. So, Brian, why don't you read 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1, and then adding to that, we're going to look at James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, and kind of get an outline of exactly what it was that Elijah started to do. Okay, 1 Kings 17, verse 1, to start, and Elijah the Tishbite said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. And then moving to James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, Elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain. Okay, so was that a victory? Well, of course it was a victory. Elijah was given the right to pray for three and a half years. Because as, as he said in, in 1 Kings there, God has revealed to me that there will not be dew or rain except at my word. That's a pretty wonderful thing that God gave to Elijah. And that's exactly what happened. And so the first aspects or the first introduction to Elijah is a great victory. And the victory that Elijah faced here was also intertwined with a con what we call the contest between Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal. And God wants again, God shows a great victory through Elijah. So in 1 Kings chapter 18, you just want to kind of get us up to speed here on what's going on. And so Jeff, would you like to read uh, 1 Kings 18 verses 
uh, 17 through 19. And of course, this is Elijah talking. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Um, certainly, and at, at the very least, you can kind of see a contrast, if you will, between Elijah, you know, by himself <laughs> versus, you know, 800 plus prophets of the false gods that were, you know, dominating the uh, the culture and the country at the time. Yes, that's a that's a really good point. And and the reason we're we're starting here is because what a tremendous opportunity for Elijah. I mean, to be in a situation where God knows these 450 prophets are going to pray and pray and pray and pray over their altar and nothing's going to happen. And then Elijah is going to pray one time and the entire altar is basically going to uh, catch on fire, even the stones and even the water. And so here we've got a man who's set up to win, who's set up to be victorious. And like I say, when you get a, an opportunity to work for God in this kind of a situation, then it is always going to end in victory. And the reason we want to look at this is because, yes, it does end in victory, and yet it also it will ultimately end in how uh, Elijah perceives it to be defeat. And so we learn in Again, and most of what we're reading today is in Acts or in First Kings chapter 18, which I would really urge our the people who are listening to the podcast maybe to stop right now and go read First Kings 18 and then come back. But the the point is that uh, uh, God has given Elijah a wonderful task that is going to end up making him completely victorious. So we learn the setting, and starting in verse 20, and we're going to look at verses 20 and 21. So, Brian, would you like to read that for us, please? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, before we do that, Alan, I appreciate you encouraging everybody to read 1 Kings 18, because it gives you an idea of what kind of a threatening environment Elijah was operating in. You know, if you look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, it talks about Jezebel, who was the wife of Ahab, massacred the prophets of the Lord to the point where it says that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them 50 to a cave and had fed them with bread and water. So like Jeff mentioned, they were outnumbered, number one, the false prophets versus the Lord's prophets. And number two, Ahab's wife Jezebel was actively massacring the prophets. So it was a very threatening environment. And uh, anyhow, it kind of gives us a greater appreciation with what uh, Elijah had to deal with. Okay, First Kings chapter 18, verse 20. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. So in this particular passage, we see God setting up the contest. He's got all of Israel there. He's got all of the false prophets there that are eating at Jezebel's table, which proves that they were the especially favored ones, the ones that, at least from Jezebel's perspective, could be put forth as being the most powerful and great prophets could bring into this, this contest. And so Elijah now sets it up. How long are you faltering between two opinions? And we see the similar things today. We see God's people struggling with evolution, struggling with the moral and ethical uh, circumstances. And then we see Christians who are just reading their scriptures and following God. And there's oftentimes a faltering because as we're out among the worldly people, uh, sometimes it's really difficult to take that stand to be excluded, to be reviled, to be persecuted. And so that's what he's asking these people to do. And of course, it's, a, it's something that we need to think about as well, because this faltering between two opinions is, is the doubt and the wavering that often all Christians have to deal with. And so he makes the point, if, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if there is no God, and if the people, like, like Paul said, if the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Uh, 
Well, the people are just listening, and again, as we know, God is going to give him a great victory. And Jeff, why don't we uh, look at that victory in uh, chapter 18, verses 37 to 39? Okay. And something else I'll add before I do that. Of course, for the our listeners who may not be familiar with the story, you know, Elijah gives the you know prophets, the false prophets, you know, instructions. You know, go prepare an altar. You know, go put. Uh, you know, sacrifice on the altar, and you guys go first, right? But don't put fire on your altar. Let let the fire come from your god, Baal. And, of course, they set it up, and then they start, you know, shouting and crying and cutting themselves, etc., to, you know, implore their god to, you know, consume the sacrifice with fire. And that goes on for hour after hour after hour. Uh... And Elijah's there on the side, kind of mocking them. He said, well, maybe you need to cry louder because perhaps your God is asleep or, you know, maybe he's gone on a journey or whatever. And so, you know, it, you know most of the day is spent on doing that. And then finally, it becomes Elijah's turn. And he starts, oh, and I might also add, let's see if we're going to talk about it. Uh, yeah. Um, so, built the altar. He put, you know, sacrifice on the altar, or wood, and then sacrifice. And, and then told the people, okay, put water on it. Put more water on it. Put more water on it. So this thing was just totally drenched in water. You know, impossible to light, uh, to light the wood. Anyway, so with that in mind, then he turns to God and offers this prayer, starting in verse 37. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me, as this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Short prayer, verse 38. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Yeah, and... You know, I just can't even hardly imagine. I try to put myself in Elijah's uh, shoes and try to feel what he must have felt at that moment. But the the joy, the vindication, the sense of accomplishment, I have brought the people back to God. And he must have just thought that he had truly fulfilled exactly what God wanted him to do. And yet very quickly the table is going to be turned because, as I say, when we look to God, we see the victory. But even after the ten plagues, we know that the children of Israel still turned back to Egypt. They still could not ever learn to trust in God because they didn't have any faith. And sadly, even though we have this great outcome here, just like the ten plagues and just like the, the army of Egypt being drowned in the sea, uh, ultimately, it didn't change anything because the very people that Elijah here wanted to influence and the very people Moses wanted to influence, uh, their hearts were hard and they could not be moved. And so we, uh, we now move to the, uh, the next victory because right after this, it probably is, well, it is the same day, uh, God sends him up to the top of Mount Carmel. And now he's going to regain another victory. He's going to pray for rain, and God's going to immediately send the rain. And it's just a, a tremendous story. So we want to look at uh, 1 Kings 18, 41 through 45. But we're going to break it up a little bit. Uh, we're going to skip a couple of portions of it. And, and if you want to read it later yourselves, that would be great. So, Brian, why don't you read 1 Kings 18, 41 through 45 for us, with again, with a few gaps that are going to be there. Here it says, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of, an, of abundance of rain. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, Go up. Say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. 
All right, so again, try to put yourself in Elijah's shoes. I mean, here he goes up on the top of the mountain, and he prays seven times, and the rain has come, and God has given him two tremendous, what would we call them, miraculous victories. The miraculous victory of the fire coming down from heaven, and now the miraculous victory of rain coming at his word. And so the prophets of Baal are dead, the people have shouted, Jehovah is God, the drought is over, and as far as Elijah is concerned, the new age has come. And now things are going to go back to the way they should, and the people are going to be faithful, and everything is going to be wonderful. But within a day or so, everything flips, and now here is Elijah asking God to die. And it's just a, such a fascinating contrast between victory and defeat in the same period. But the reason for the defeat is, is the key to what we're trying to accomplish today. Because, you know, we can look at Elijah and we can feel real good about him, but then we have to go back to our own personal lives. And so, but this story, as Jesus said, look at the prophets. If you want to be able to rejoice in persecution when people are excluding you and reviling you and hating you and sending out your name as evil then there's a vital lesson that we all have to learn and the lesson is the jobs god i hate to use the word job the work god gives us to do is often going to end in failure because we are going to be trying to influence worldly people who don't want to be influenced. And we'll see this a little bit later. God says to Ezekiel, they're not going to listen to you because they don't listen to me. And we'll see it with Samuel where he says, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So there was no way for Elijah to win if the people themselves would not repent and turn back to God. That's what he expected to happen. And Again, we're all, we're all result-oriented. We'd like to see fruits from our labor. But sometimes, as God told Isaiah after he asked, how long do you want me to, how long do you want me to preach? And God says, until there's no one left in the cities and all the cities are destroyed. And I'm sure he's, Isaiah's thinking to himself, wow, uh, there's not going to be a lot of good results from my preaching. And so here's the situation, all right? And, and so let's look at what happens next and how he responds to it. So now we're in 1 Kings 19, which again, if our readers would like to, they, it would probably be a good idea to look at maybe all of these verses to see the context. You can do it now or later, but let's, uh, we're just going to start in 1 Kings 19, verses 2 and 3. And Jeff, I think you're up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and just... Real briefly before I start that, you know, keep in mind, you know, Ahab, Ahab is the king, you know, supreme ruler of the land. And he was there on Mount Carmel, saw what happened, saw the miracle, saw the rain. And you would think life would be now, as you said, good, you know, from a spiritual perspective. But his wife, Jezebel, the queen was, should I say, unconvinced, so to speak. Uh, 1 Kings 19, beginning with verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Them being the prophets uh, that Elijah had uh, killed. Meaning, basically, she's going to kill him. Uh, verse 3, and when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die and said, ah, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. So here we have Elijah remembering everything that he had done and all of the wonderful things that he had done. And now we have a threat from Jezebel. And as pointed out earlier, this was not a, uh, vi a, excuse me, a threat that had no substance to it. She'd already killed most of the prophets. And Elijah knew that if that's what she wanted to do, then she was going to be able to do it. And so he rises up and flees for his life. 
but you can see the discouragement in verse 4. The victory of the rain, the victory of the people saying Jehovah is God, has now evaporated because the results prove that nothing good came. So he prays to God, it is enough, take my life. Now the rest of the uh, of this chapter, we have him going to uh, one of the mountains that God has already worked with in the past, and he is praying, and God appears first in a mighty wind, and then in a still small voice. And now God is speaking with Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? And here is Elijah's answer in verse 10. Brian, you like to read that for us, please? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. And you know, it's interesting, Alan, you would think, certainly with Ahab, we know Jezebel wasn't there because, as it says in the first part of chapter 19, he went back and told Jezebel what happened about this contest and that, you know, Elijah had slain the 400 prophets of Baal, or he had the Israelites do that. And you kind of gather that maybe Elijah felt like, okay, hey, you know, we won this contest. Uh, everything's going to be great now. The people are, you know, see that, that the Lord is God. And oh, by the way, we've eliminated these false prophets or several of them. And so I almost gather that maybe he felt like everything, we're, we're sort of home free now, right? But well, as you pointed out, no, because now Jezebel's threatening his life and he's almost probably astonished that he has to flee and would likely lose his, lose his life if she caught up with him, so to speak. Yeah, and that, that's exactly right. He lost his focus. While he was focused on God and God's desires and God's victory, he was strong for three and a half years. He didn't waver at all. But now here he is looking at the results of his work. He said, I've been very zealous for you, but here's the results. They've forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I'm the only one left. So here he is at the very bottom. Um, from, from, the, uh, from the total victory to now total defeat. Now what happened? Nothing changed. God had given him a great victory, and that should have been enough for him. But sadly, he lost his focus on God. And he started focusing on the results of his work. And, and I just can't emphasize enough to all of our listeners that whenever you feel discouragement, if you can just remember, I'm looking at results. I have to stop looking at results. I have to start looking at the God I'm serving and the ultimate victory, realizing that if they're not going to serve God, then there's nothing I can say. And I can work and work and work because God has asked us to do so. Go into all the world, preach the gospel of the whole creation. We have, an, we have a responsibility. But as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says there, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Paul lived in the fullness of time. And if you look at his work and the results of his work, you start thinking to yourself, wow, what a successful, what a successful preacher and apostle. And yet he continues on by saying, so then he who sows and he who waters are nothing but God who gives the increase. So you see, it, it, if we're born in history, and we're all going to be born in a certain period of history. Noah clearly was born in a time where every imagination of the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. And he lived in a time where it was God's intent to destroy the entire earth with a flood. And it was only Noah's task to put those animals in the ark, which he did, and to get as many as people as possible in the ark, which he did. So he was victorious in the work God asked him to do, but how he felt about it would be really interesting because we look at periods of history where the children of Israel are faithful like they are when they come out of uh, the 40-year wilderness wandering and for that next generation Joshua was victorious again and again and again and again um, and and yet by the time of Jeremiah there was 
there was to be no victory. Children of Israel had become so corrupt, and God sent him as their last hope, but he knew even as they as as he started that that was going to be the results of of uh so here we uh we look and we see what God does to Elijah. He brings him back and helps him regain his focus. You're working with me. You are not I did not send you to get results. I sent you to do the work. And so now I want you to focus again. Here's the work I want you to do. So uh Jeff, would you like to read 1 Kings 19 verses 16 through 18? Sure. Before going there, so there was what maybe a, a side observation uh, that you know Brian, as he was reading, uh, that may have been influencing Elijah's thinking as well. Uh, you know, in his discussion with God, uh, talking about what the children of Israel have done, uh, had killed their prophets. I alone am left, and I think there's a little bit of a lesson there, perhaps. That, you know, if if we're standing with a group, you know, there's uh, some you know, mutual encouragement back and forth, if you will. But if you get to this mindset that says, well, you know, I'm I'm the only one, you know, out here all by myself. Woe is me, etc. But, you know, if, if we're at the very least, if if we're doing what God wants us to do, we are never alone because <laughs> we have, you know, God. But at least with in addition to that, with faithful Christians you know, banding together, et cetera. So again, perhaps more of a, a side issue. Uh, coming to the passage you mentioned, yeah, God tells him basically, get up, Elijah, get busy. <laughs> uh, 1 Kings 19, beginning verse 16. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola. Hopefully I didn't butcher that too badly. You shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hezael, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. 7,000. All whose knees have not bowed to Baal. And every mouth that has not kissed him. So truly Elijah may have been felt discouraged, depressed, because he was all alone. But, you know, that was not the case. Excellent point. And uh, once again, Elijah focusing on the results of his work, and all he can see is the outside. Now, we don't know how many of these 7,000 people Elijah just influenced by this contest with Baal and the returning of the rain from the drought, but Elijah was wrong. He was not the only one left. There were still 7,000 people on his side. Now, he didn't know them. He didn't know where they were or who they were. That didn't matter. The fact is, Elijah, come back to me. Focus on me. Don't focus on the results of your individual efforts. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Israel and anoint Jehu. And, of course, the story of Jehu is the first thing he does Yes, he goes out, he kills Jezebel, he kills or has killed all of the sons of Ahab, and once again, a tremendous victory. Now, Elijah didn't live to see it, but God knew, I will ultimately be victorious, and God always will be. He has power and glory and majesty and understanding, and we cannot oppose his will. And so we will ultimately be victorious, but God doesn't want to just end the world and give us all victory. He wants us to keep working and try to influence more people. So first Jehu, then uh, he is to anoint Elisha. And of course, Elisha's work is tremendous, what he is able to accomplish. So his successor, and again, this is a victory. This is a victory for Elijah. I want you to appoint Jehu. I want you to appoint Elijah. And then... Uh, I want you to realize something, and that is that ultimately we will be victorious. And then, Elijah, let me deal with one more point here. You think you're the only one left? Not even close. There's still 7,000 people in Israel. So we don't know the outcome. We don't know if Elijah was still really discouraged, but he continued on, or whether he got his 
uh, zeal back, his more than conquerors attitude back, uh, but he does faithfully live out his life doing the very things that God asked him to do. And so, as we learn in the New Testament, uh, God gave Elijah a great role in his work, and he did it, and now he's one of those more than conquerors. And so, this is this is the thing that we need to understand. And so now what we want to do, we're just going to quickly look at some of the other people. You remember what Jesus said, you need to rejoice, but just realize something. They didn't do anything differently with the prophets that then you're going to find. And you're going to find your life possibly being fruitless from the perspective of uh, results. But you will never be fruitless if you are doing the work God asks you to do, just realize that uh, things ebb and flow. There are some generations where many people are going to become Christians, where great victories are going to be uh, given, and there are other times where uh, a nation's about to fall, the people are wicked, the work that the Christians are doing is not being productive, but we're not looking at results. Now, the next verse we want to look at in Isaiah has to do with uh, the call of Isaiah. And again, because of our time constraints, we can't read all of the amazing things that God allowed Eli or, or Isaiah to, to see and the wonderful uh, things that occurred. But I just want to focus on how God called him and how God revealed to him what the results would be. And so we want to look at Isaiah chapter 6, verses uh, 8 through 11. And Brian, would you like to read that for us? Sure. Here it says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell the, this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate. Yeah, you know, Alan, this is to me a, a good example of how sometimes God would have the prophets, as you're pointing out, say things, do things, knowing that it would result in failure, right? God's telling them that. But yet, you know, God was really giving his people a chance to repent. And when this destruction would ultimately come through other nations and so forth, they couldn't say that God didn't give them the opportunity to repent. So even though it may not have been clear or even understandable to some of these prophets as to why would they do this knowing it was going to end in failure, well, sometimes it's it's for those sorts of things or often, right, to be able to repent and so forth. Right. And we'll never know how many people ultimately were saved as a result of the work that they did, even though they couldn't turn the tide, if they could bring one person back to the Lord, what a glorious situation that would be. And sadly, they may, they may never know it. And that's the problem is that we don't get to see the results oftentimes. We don't get to see inside of people's hearts and watch how we are, through the Word of God, changing them and until the judgment day uh, and and the ultimate results and we may never even know then i don't know how much god's going to reveal to us about our lives and the effects effects of our lives on other people but none of that should matter uh, and so here's a job you will preach until the cities are laid waste without inhabitant you will preach until the houses are without a man and you will preach until the land is utterly desolate now if i'm isaiah and i'm looking at those three statements cities laid waste without inhabitant houses have no men in it and the land is utterly desolate i'm going to be thinking to myself this work that i've been set to do is going to be just like noah it's going to be just like Moses who brought 600,000 people into the wilderness to bring to the promised land and then gets to see only two people get to cross over into the promised land. The rest of them have all died in the wilderness. I mean, there are so many examples of God's servants having great victories and yet being unable to influence the very people that those victories were supposed to influence and that's not the prophet's fault. 
But sometimes the prophet, if he's focusing on results, starts taking it personal. Now, we don't know if, he's, if Isaiah did or not. I, I suspect from everything we see about Isaiah's life, not one time do we see any discouragement. He just, whatever God sends him to do, he does. Whatever God sends him to say, he says. And we see nothing in the life of Isaiah that would lead us to think he was discouraged. And if he wasn't discouraged, it was because he focused on God, not on results. And again, that's the theme of this podcast. And here we are thousands of years later, and we are in the exact same situation. Now, some of us are living in cultures where our efforts are producing things and we feel good about what we're doing. Some of us are living in cultures where no matter how hard we work, we see very little results and we feel like the work we're doing doesn't have any value because we're not seeing results. Well, for God, uh, he sent Isaiah, he sent Noah, he sent Moses knowing what the end result would be, and yet it was part of his plan. And being a part of God's plan should be enough for us. That should be, we're more than conquerors because we're helping God with his work. Now, sadly, the results may not be what we're looking for. As Jesus said, blessed are you when they persecute you. Blessed are you when they cast out your name as evil. So Jesus is trying to get us prepared to understand that the results of our work may end up in persecution, but if they do, it's not because we failed, we should rejoice, we should be happy with that. And again, it's it's very simple and it's very clear uh, that God wants us to focus on him. Now when we come to Ezekiel, Ezekiel's situation is very interesting, and God warns him as he starts his work about how it's going to go, but then he gives them, he gives him the opportunity to realize that it's not your fault. So, Jeff, why don't you read Ezekiel chapter 3, uh, and I guess it's just verse 7. Okay. But the house of Israel will not listen to you, because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. So it's almost like God saying, well, Ezekiel, just consider that, yeah, I'm, I'm sending you on this mission. I got this task for you to go do. But in the end, they're not going to listen to you. But still, go go do what I ask you to do. Yeah, and that's exactly the point that I'm hoping our listeners will come away from. And I've, I'm the point that I hope I can hold on to my whole life. And that is, God sends us to preach the word. That's what he told Timothy to do. Preach the word. Be urgent, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. But then Paul says, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap up teachers and turn aside to fables. Now, Timothy probably lived to see that. And Timothy, having watched Paul and all the great victories, may have taken it personal. But that passage would help him not to. And the same thing here with Ezekiel. They will not listen to you because they won't listen to me. Now, what we're seeing today in many many of the religions is, well, if they won't listen to us because they won't listen to God, then we'll change the message so they will listen to us. But how can that work? How can it work? that we change God's message, which ultimately will be the, as Jesus said in John chapter 12, 48, the words I have spoken will judge in the last day. And so here we are now changing those words so that we can still be effective. And once again, it's the same problem. We're looking at results. We want results. We need to look to God. And God said, if they won't listen to me, they're not going to listen to you. That's how I want it. And the, and the reason they won't listen to you is because they're impudent and hard-hearted. And those of you who are listening today, the world we live in, there's a lot of impudent and hard-hearted people. And you look at them and you know before you go in, if you're going to go up against these people and talk to them, uh, you're going to be persecuted. And sometimes we're afraid because we're not looking at God and we're not looking at what God has asked us to do. So it wasn't Ezekiel's fault. And God tells him going in, it won't be your fault because they won't listen to me. Now, the same thing happened to Samuel. Samuel lived a good life. He worked really hard. It, it, uh, uh, 
Uh, he was faithful his whole life, but when it came time for him to die and for his sons to take his place, the children of Israel saw it as an opportunity to get rid of the judges altogether. So here's Samuel looking at the work of his life, realizing that these people are going to leave God's plan and make a king like the rest of the nations. And it led him to great sorrow and displeasure. But then God comes and God gives him the answer. And it's a sad answer, but it's an answer that we all need to remember because we may find ourselves in the same position. So, Brian, you want to read uh, 1 Samuel 8, verses uh, 5 through 8? Here it says, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Yeah, I like, Alan, here how God's giving Samuel some perspective, right? Saying that they've always been this way. It's no different from generation to generation. And I also kind of feel like it, to me, takes a burden off Samuel and really should take a burden off of us in the sense that God is is in control, realize that they are truly rejecting God and not us. And so, you know, much like we're told in Galatians 6, we should therefore not be weary in doing well, but let the Lord sort all that out in the judgment day. Yeah, and, and that's that's the point. We can't afford to take it personally. We are not even in the equation, actually. We're preaching God's word. We are simply the messenger who is bringing God's word to the people. What they do with it has nothing to do with our ability. We can be what, what we might call the golden-tongued orator. We might be somebody who can preach God's word and in an amazing way, and yet the people aren't going to hear because, as uh, God told Samuel, they're not going to re- they're not going to listen to you. They rejected me, and not you. And this is you're enduring exactly what I've had to put up with since the people came out of Egypt. And I really like that because, again, Jesus said, "Look to the prophets." And here is a classic and wonderful opportunity for us to to put things in perspective. Because, as I say, we are given a task, and we are working with God, and we are in fellowship with God. But if the people are not going to listen to God, then there's no way they're going to listen to us. And if... The circumstances are such, and often preachers have to deal with this. They preach to the people their whole life, and then, as Paul told Timothy, they turn aside to fables. And suddenly, here's a preacher preaching the truth to God's people, and God's people saying, look, we're leaving this now. We don't want to teach baptism for remission of sins anymore, and we we don't want to keep the church pure, and we don't want to have to teach what the Lord has been teaching. And a lot of preachers are going to say, My life is ending in failure. Everything I've done for the last 20 years, and now it's all for nothing. And I think that's what Samuel's dealing with here. I mean, he's the last of the judges. He's also the first of the prophets. So here he is. He's worked his whole life. And as a result of all the work he's done, they they want a king. We don't want judges anymore. We want a king. Well, it wasn't a reflection on Samuel, although I think he took it that way. Uh, But God told him, no, that's not what's happening here, Samuel. You're really not in this at all. They are rejecting you because they're rejecting me. And he actually puts it a little differently. They have not rejected you. Well, wait a minute, God, Samuel might say, what do you mean they haven't rejected me? They have just said, we don't want judges anymore. God says, no, no, that's not you. They've rejected me that I should not reign over them. And so it's it's just fascinating. And again, all these prophets that we've looked at, we've looked at it, we've looked at uh, Elijah, we've looked at Isaiah, we've looked at Ezekiel, 
And now we're looking at Samuel, and what are we seeing over and over and over again? What we're seeing is, as Jesus said, look to the prophets. Look to the prophets, because they give you the key and the clue so that you can rejoice, even though the results are like this, that people are persecuting you. You know, it's so hard when people are persecuting us not to think, I said something I shouldn't have said. I made a blunder. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have been this harsh or I shouldn't have been this clear. Um, but that's not the problem. It doesn't matter. I mean, you can be patient and never preach God's word to them and they're going to treat you well. But the moment you start preaching God's word, they're going to reject you. Why? Because they've already rejected God. So we just have to decide, is it more important for me to do the will of God and be persecuted? Or is it more important for me to compromise and get along with people because I want good results? And this is a choice that many churches are having to make today, what we call denominational churches. And many of them are changing the message. They are no longer holding fast to the teachings that God has told us in the scriptures. They are modifying them to please the people. And the only thing that's going to result in is them being charged on the last day for rejecting God's word and for rejecting God. They're going to have done the same thing that people have done. Um, because, and, and this is something that God told Jeremiah. They should return to you, but you should not return to them. And this was the struggle that the prophet was having. All of his work, they hated him, they laughed at him, they mistreated him. And he knew the only way for me is to go back to them. We, I just need to be one of them, and I need to talk like they talk and act like they act. But God says, if you do that, then you will no longer be my prophet. So you return to me. And you continue to deal with the rejection. Now, we want to change directions a little bit here because I want to talk a little bit about the circumstances of the world that we live in and how there are times when there is prosperity, there is peace, there is comfort, and we all want to live in times like that. And most of us, if we're, if we're older, if we're in our 30s or 40s, we have lived in times like that. And yet, the possibility exists, and this is what God was warning Baruch. Baruch wanted to live in a time where everything was peaceful and service to God brought prosperity and joy and peace and good results. Well, Baruch is living in the days of Jeremiah. As a matter of fact, he's, one of Jer he's with Jeremiah's servant. And God is just about to destroy the city of Jerusalem and bring the people into Babylonian captivity. Everything's going to be destroyed. And Baruch is not handling it well. It's not what he expected. It is not what he wanted. And of course, all of us, if our nation falls, if we end up as a slave in another nation, we're going to be looking to God and we're going to be thinking to ourselves, how could you have failed me like this? But it wasn't a failure. So God gives Baruch a talking to. And Jeff, would you like to read that for us? This is in Jeremiah chapter 45, verses uh, 2 through 5. Okay. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch. You said, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built, I will break down, and what I have planted, I will pluck up. That is, this whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them, for behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. Yeah, interesting uh, contrast. If, yeah, evidently, you know, Baruch might have been, uh, or I guess must have been, uh, you know, complaining about, you know, the circumstances or uh, what the Lord was having uh, Jeremiah do or the, the prophecy of the coming destruction. And he was kind of getting somewhat, uh, you know, discouraged. And, you know, the Lord, you know, is trying to say, well, you know, this will indeed happen. But the good news is at least you will survive <laughs> the, the coming destruction as well as 
people being you know cast out of the land as as you said a uh, captive or you know taken into a foreign country which would be very very traumatic to say the least yeah and that's again circumstances are in god's control messages are in god's control the time we are born in and the people we deal with those are within god's control and here's baruch who wants to live in the days of david or solomon where prosperity and ease and comfort are all around him and he doesn't get to live in those times so what does he say in verse three does he say thy will be done no he says woe is me and then he says something is completely wrong the lord has added grief to my sorrow what a terrible charge against the lord that is not true just like jesus said you can rejoice in circumstances like this if you look to the prophets well baruch's not looking in the right direction and so god says Here's what I'm about to do. It's got nothing to do with you. I'm going to break down. I'm going to pluck up the whole land. And are you now looking? Are you wanting me to change my will? Are you wanting me to, to, to do things differently? Do you seek great things for yourself? He said, don't seek them. That's the solution here. The solution is not for me to change my will. The solution is for you to stop looking to get prosperity and peace and comfort and joy and just to do my will do not seek them because i'm going to bring adversity to all flesh and it's not personal baruch it's not because of you because here's what i'm going to do i'm going to give you your life as a prize so again we can't control the time of our birth we can't control the people that we're preaching to we can't control the circumstances that we need to leave, live in god has put us in a time where he needs us and God needs us today just as badly as he needed Paul in the days that Paul lived. And we need to get our courage from what God has asked us to do. And we need to avoid the discouragement of uh, the results or the circumstances that we live in. Now, the same thing is true. We're going to jump ahead to the New Testament now. We've got a couple more verses we want to look at. So uh, God is, the, the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrew people near the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. And most people think this book was written sometime after Paul's death, which would have been about 65. So he has... Uh, this book is written within the last five years of Israel's existence. And so God is warning the Israelites, because they see it's coming. They, they, excuse me, the Israelite Christians. And so in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 35 through 39, he gives us a similar warning that he did to Baruch. He gives us a similar warning that he has given to many of his prophets and so let's look at that verse 35 through 39. Brian, would you please read that for us. Here it says, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Wonderful passage. Yes, it is. And it, it captures everything that we've tried to accomplish in this podcast. There's a code word that only God's people would understand in verse 37. Yet a little while, he who is coming will come and not tarry, now the just shall live by faith. This comes directly from the book of Habakkuk. When Habakkuk is complaining, Lord, things are so wicked, things are so evil, nothing is being done right, why are you not doing something? And God says, I am doing something, I'm going to bring Babylon, and Babylon is going to destroy this nation. Well, Habakkuk's thinking to himself, that's not what I wanted, that's not exactly the solution here. And so he says, I, I want to talk to God more about this, and that's when God says to him, in a little while, he who is coming will come and will not tarry. And the only thing you can do is live by your faith. If you want to continue to be righteous, if you want to be continue to be just, well, the Hebrews knew this. And they know it's not Babylon that's coming, it's Rome. 
and they know that the trials are coming, and so God just tells them, look to me. Don't look at the fence. Don't look at circumstances. You need endurance so that you continue to do the will of God and receive the promise. Because in verse 38, if you draw back at this point, if you get discouraged and you say, God, I just can't go on, my soul has no pleasure. You shouldn't have done that. You should have looked to me. You should have looked to the, the conquering nature of the position I put you in. Don't draw back to perdition. And that's what he says in verse 39. We're not of those. We're not like that. And I hope that every one of our listeners can put himself in this passage of Scripture. And so the last passage that we want to look at in our podcast today is it's coming from Hebrews chapter 12. And once again, it all has to do with perspective. I've used this illustration for years. If you have your hand as far away from your body as you can possibly have it, it blocks a tiny portion of your vision. But the closer you bring your hand, pretty soon you can't see anything. And that's what perspective is. If you focus too much on the negative, you lose sight of God, you lose sight of everything, and you are drowning in your own foolish views because you've lost sight of the fact that God is in control. You're working for God. You're working with God. You are going to be victorious because God's going to be victorious. But many times the people who reject God, God wants to give them an opportunity to repent. Remember 2 2 Peter 3 where he says, God is not slack concerning his promises as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to all, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So if I have to endure terrible things so that God can save another soul, we should be willing to do that. So he sends us to Jesus now. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and let's think about these things as we wind down our podcast today. So I'm going to ask Jeff to read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, of course, that hearkening back to the previous chapter and the hall faithful let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking into jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of god For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So here we have a passage that encapsulates everything that we have put forth in this podcast. Matter of fact, we could have just read this verse at the beginning and said, this is our podcast for today. But the reality is we have to look at those that great cloud of witnesses. Jesus talked about it. He said they persecuted the prophets like they're going to persecute you. We have a great cloud of witnesses. And Jeff, you're right. In chapter 11, he talks of Abel and Noah and Enoch and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and Moses. And he just keeps going. And then, of course, at the end, he talks about the victories of some who got to live in times of victory, but then he says others had trials of mockings, they were afflicted, they went about in goatskins and sheepskins, they lived in the caves of the earth. Now, that's the gamut. That's the perspective of what we could have in our life. We may be one of those people who gets to live in a time where God is going to give victory because he has victory because the people are ready to hear his word. There are also going to be times when we're going to live in sheepskins and goatskins and be afflicted and live in the caves of the earth because God has been rejected and we're still on his side. So we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. So we need to say, lay aside our weights. There are discouraging things. We can all look back, and, and, and even now, I think if you were honest with yourselves, uh, all of you who are listening, we have weights. And we need to get rid of them. We're we're looking to God, not to circumstances. And we need to get rid of the sin, which so easily ensnares us, and run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, our race may have rocks, it may have potholes, or our race might be on smooth surfaces. It doesn't matter what the race is. 
But now we come to verse uh, verse 2, where Jesus' race was to end in his death. And he was to be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was to be rejected. He was to be mistreated. That was the race God gave him. Now, no one's ever been given a race like Jesus. And Jesus never got discouraged because he never stopped looking at God. If he'd have looked at the results of his work, he might have done what Elijah did. But he refused to do that. And we need to look at him. He's the author and the perfecter or finisher of our faith. And it was joy that he felt when he endured the cross. Again, not looking at the cross, looking at God, looking at the effect of his work. He's going to save every one of God's faithful servants. Now, he's going to save them by being killed. So it's a, certainly a paradox. It's certainly an interesting way. But after that prayer in the garden where he's crying and weeping, now he's focused. I'm doing this for God. It's God's will. He removes the crying and he replaces it with the same joy he asks us to have. So for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He hated the shame. He wouldn't even let the shame into his heart. And now, where is he? He's at the right hand of God, exalted. So, did he get the victory? Absolutely. Did he go through defeat? Absolutely. Verse 3, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners. Now again, this is the problem. It's the sinners. If they reject me, they'll reject you. If they hate me, they're going to hate you. And so he endured hostility, not personally, but because he never stopped preaching God's word. And then he makes our, the final ap application. Don't become weary. Don't become discouraged in your souls. So how do we do that? Not by caving, not by compromising, not by changing, but by changing our perspective. We're not looking at the results of our work or how people respond to our work. We're looking at God and the work that God has asked us to do. And so we need to realize that the moment we think it's not fair, we're looking in the wrong direction. If we start feeling sorry for ourselves, if we start feeling weary and discouraged, we just need to wake ourselves up. This is going to happen. But we take ourselves back, we look at Elijah, we look at Isaiah, we look at Ezekiel, we look at Baruch, and we put ourselves in whatever set of circumstances we're in, and then we become more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so I really hope that this podcast has been helpful, been very helpful to me through the years. Uh, I get discouraged, but when I do, I go to God and I redirect my focus because we are more than conquerors and the victory will be ours. Yeah, Alan, this has been really, really good. I appreciate you going through this in, in kind of meticulous detail. And for me, you know, as I look at what you've covered in this podcast, I feel like one of the overarching key points that you've made is that it's important for us to maintain perspective. You know, it's all too easy, much like Elijah, to think that we're the only one in our community, our town, in our family, whatever it might be, when, as you've pointed out very clearly, that's not the case. And the second big point for me that's a takeaway that I find encouraging is to realize that God will sort all of this out, that we simply need to do the good works that he gave us to do, Ephesians 2.10, and be happy or considered a victory that we're doing what he has asked us to do. And then really it's left up to those who are hearing the message to make that decision to do God's will or not and that he will sort it out in the judgment day. So appreciate that. Very good thoughts. Jeff, let me turn it over to you for any uh, thoughts that you have, and we'll let you close out this podcast. Sure. Yeah, in some ways I can see you know, today's podcast being, uh, hopefully, uh, as we've said, a very encouraging podcast. Because I know sometimes we can you know, get into our own heads and feel – you know, not only discouraged, but sort of like growing weary or what's the point or what's the use or, you know, why should we try or or maybe we can compromise some and, and make lives, you know, better for ourselves or quote unquote easier relationships with 
our family or friends or, or, or co-workers if we just kind of give in you know go along to get along kind of thing but you know as we tried to point out today keeping our eyes on god and our eyes on the prize and you know having that uh, proper perspective you know it can certainly you know help us you know endure what you know can be considered you know very very difficult and and long prolonged uh slog if you will to uh, uh you know throughout our entire lives you know in addition i might want to mention to our listeners uh, like we always like to do as we end the podcast to refer people back to our website at biblequestions.org where under the topics menu item have a you know alphabetical listing a through z of various topics at least for you know today's podcast you can look under d for discouragement but it'll vector you back over to s for suffering also z for zeal uh, which certainly is is related to uh, our topic as well and as always you know check out the material especially read the scripture references don't take our word for it and see what you can do to take uh, the bible and apply it to your lives to avoid discouragement and to uh, avoid becoming weary and as we've been encouraging to feel more than conquerors in our daily struggles thank you for listening to this edition of the bible questions podcast we invite you to visit our website biblequestions.org where you can submit a bible question to be answered and you can also search archives where we have answered several hundred Bible questions over the years. Our website also has a host of free Bible study material, free correspondence courses, as well as sermons and a host of other material. Please stop by and check it out.